So, welcome tonight. This series, The Comforters Come, will be sharing tonight the practical side of moving in step with God. Someone say amen. Tonight, we will again open up the scripture to the supernatural equipment given to us over 2,000 years ago. Like the mantle of the Lord. Everyone say, mantle of the Lord. Okay, and sure, we should know what a mantle is, and I'm going to show you, give you kind of a, a fun illustration. All right, so we're going to learn about the mantle of the Lord. Amen. Here it is thought, God really has left all this marvelous equipment for you and I to, to grab hold of, and he gave us the precious Holy Spirit to counsel and to coach us how to use them. Believers then ought to find out how to use and to activate this equipment for God's glory. Someone say amen. amen. I believe there are a few keys and truths that will be, help us understand how the kingdom works. Remember, you're in a kingdom. You're a subject of the kingdom. You're a citizen of the kingdom. You're also a child of the living God. Amen. So within the kingdom, there is a set of what I call uh, Bill of Rights. Through Christ, not your own selfish rights, and a constitution. It's called the New Testament. Can you say amen? So we'll go past that and, and listen. Tonight, we'll open up revelation knowledge on the mantle and how we take it up. Everyone say, take it up. Once a truth has been caught by a believer, not just listened to, but caught and brought and embraced, then the Holy Spirit will take us into that guided tour of that truth and open our eyes. Let's have some of the fun, right, tonight? Okay. The mantle of the Lord. So I brought a fake mantle. It's known as a bathroom towel. <laughs> a mantle basically is a, a, a girded and it covered you. And it's a, it was sort of like a, a tunic, but not. It was sort of like um, a coat, but not. I remember when my pastor taught about it, he had this long coat. It was one of those, what did he call it? Navy coats. What are they called? I said it. It was a trench coat. Is that it? All right. You know, it goes all almost to the ground. And one time this lady actually died. She's laying there on the couch dead. Right there, died in front of us. And he takes off his, his trench coat and lays it on her. says, Lord, I lay down my mantle upon her. I'm willing to lay down my ministry if you'll raise her up from the dead. And she popped right back to life in front of about 10 people. So we're going to learn a little bit about the mantle tonight. Remember, God wants us to understand these key principles to the kingdom of God. He wants us to work in harmony with the Holy Spirit. Fifty days after the resurrection of Jesus, God sent the Holy Spirit. The kingdom established the church, sent us grace instead of the law, and then gave us the Holy Spirit to teach us all about it. Now here's the problem. It's really hard to get horses even to the water, let alone get them to drink. But yet God has opened up his heart and is willing to pour out wisdom from above and understanding of the word. So let's go ahead. Open your scriptures up to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 13 through 17. We're going to quickly look at John's baptism and the mantle of his ministry. All right, so in Matthew 3, verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee. I believe this is the Amplified, right? Looks like the Amplified. So then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And you are coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting 
for us to fulfill all righteousness. You know what he was saying? It's important that I fulfill all scripture which is written of me. Are you with me? Then he allowed him. So in the next verse, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. What is that? That's the mantle of the Holy Spirit. Different than just a physical mantle. Remember in the Old Testament, they needed a lot of miracles, signs, and physical things to illustrate spiritual matters. But in the New Testament, God came down as a dove, symbolizing the anointing on Jesus Christ and the mantle of God's gentleness in our Messiah. Are you with me? Coming down as a dove. And then he saw, and suddenly a voice came from heaven, I love that, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I can seem to remember that when Jesus was transfigured up in the mountain, God said something similar. Remember they were going to build three tabernacles? <laughs> All right, let's look at your points below it. Thank you. Point one, once Jesus fulfilled all the demands of his ministry and all the requirements of the law, fulfilling all scripture, that is what we call fulfilling all righteousness. Then the mantle fell. Did you notice that? It wasn't until all of that was done. Then the mantle fell on him. Amen. Two, Jesus was then led by the spirit into the wilderness. And who was he going to confront? He's going to confront the devil. Now, people teach it sometimes as he's going out there to be tested of the devil. Man, I think we give the devil too much credit. No, he's going out there to confront the devil saying, Hi, I'm better than you, and I'm coming to take the world back. See, that's why Jesus is called the last Adam. Because he took back what the first Adam lost. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians 15. But moving right along, Jesus was then led by the Spirit to confront the devil, to be tempted by the devil. Thus was a proving ground. We can find that in Luke chapter 4, 1 through 13. Get a chance to read it later on tonight. Point three, remember, he is a perfect man. Was Jesus perfect? But he still was the son of man. So here's something you need to grasp if you haven't already. Jesus was God. Can you say amen? He always was God. But in the way beginning, he was called the Word. Okay? He was God and he had a physical, be you know, a very being. But he's called the Word because he's going to be decreed into the earth by prophets and by kings and priests. And he's going to be born of a virgin, you see. So the word will become flesh. I hope you're getting this, all right? So remember, he's a perfect man, yet God anointed and appointed him as a man. He could fall. He could make a mistake. So the first must be proven. And so Satan comes and, Satan, uh, and Jesus is confronting him. Satan's challenging him. We call this the spiritual chess game. We do. Satan makes a move. Jesus makes a move. Checkmate. Satan makes another temptation. Jesus makes another move. Checkmate. You know? You see what I'm saying? And he's still doing that. But this time you and I are involved in obeying God. Hello. All right. So point four. Then we will tread towards town. So once Jesus rebuked the enemy, he approved. Then he will head towards town, Nazareth, to open the scripture and that's testified him. Remember in his own hometown? He's Jesus of Nazareth. Point five, it basically says the spirit of, he opened the scripture in Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me, okay, to preach the gospel to the poor. Now let's break it off there. You see, God put his mantle on Jesus. Jesus didn't come, didn't come as God. 
He came as a man anointed by God, yet perfect without sin. As sin, but without sin. Can you say amen? He looked like you and I. Subject to sin factor, yet without sin. He condemns sin in the body. All right, next point. The use of the mantle of anointing. So we're going to have some fun really going through 1 Kings chapter 19. You get a chance. Let's go there. 1 Kings 19. Verse 19. In 1 Kings 19, verse 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha. This is Elijah with a J. And he found a young man named Elisha, okay? The son of Saphat, who was plowing with his 12 yoke of oxen before him. He was with the 12. And Elijah passed by him and threw his what? His mantle on him. Come here, son. Imagine it going over the shoulders, okay? Just imagine, okay? I'm sure it was much better than that. Now remember, a mantle is something that the prophet wore. Something that said, you are a prophet. And that mantle was unusual because it would, it would permeate the anointing. In other words... The anointing that was in the prophet would go into the mantle and into the clothing that he wore. And so we can even see that in the New Testament. It says that the aprons of Paul were brought to the sick and many were delivered and demons were cast out. Okay, because it's cloth. It's made out of something that's manufactured by God or created. So the mantle, after the prophet wears it for a period of time, it's got a lot of goodies in it. Can you say amen? So the mantle is soaked with the anointing of God. Do you remember the story? It says the prophet Elijah's bones was buried in the mountain. And the prophet Elijah, when his bones were buried in there, it says they were having a war. And one of the soldiers threw this dead man into prop, the old prophet Elijah where his bones were buried. And there was so much anointing in that bones that the body hit it and he came back to life. So you figure a mantle that's being worn by somebody who clears the word all the time. We're not talking about holy underwear. <laughs> When he's getting ready to toss it, he's getting ready to toss all that God's anointing is on him and whatever God chooses to put on Elisha. We're in 1 Kings 19. So he departed from there and he threw the mantle on him. But and then and then he, he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. Remember, Elisha follows Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and my mother and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again for what have I done to you? He thought maybe he picked the child too young and maybe he was going to corrupt him by the fact that he was going to get him to leave his family too early. So that's what he's talking about. But it goes on. So Elijah turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people. And they also ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his what? His servant. Now, you know, I'm going to read the scripture to you so you don't really have to be searching too much. Okay. I want you to catch it in your ears. All right. Note number one. It's so important to understand, now listen, Elijah's willingness to study and to learn from his predecessor, Elijah. Elisha would not leave Elijah's side. Everywhere he went, I mean, she followed him to the bathroom. I mean, he didn't go in, but you know what I'm saying? He didn't want to go anywhere because this Elijah guy was kind of squirrely. He was a prophet. He could just disappear and go somewhere. And this kid didn't want to miss anything. Boy, I wish I'd have some students of the word that would just follow me around. You spend two, three hours with you. 
I mean, it's like two, three weeks because I can pump it into you. Well, these guys were a lot more credible. And not only that, when they spoke the word, the power of God was there. So this guy was just stuck to him like glue. Come off. Get off me. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? And so the principle was, remember John, John the Beloved, he says, I'm sh riding shotgun with Jesus. Remember? I'm going to stick right to him. I'm going to be Mr. Clammy Clammy. You know? And you know what? He was, of all of them, lived the longest and they couldn't kill him. I wonder if our exposure to God will keep us safe. Of course it will. Hello? And I'm wondering if John knew that. Maybe studying Elijah the prophet and Elisha, his predecessor. All right, a couple of points. Number one, notice Elijah was set by God to anoint and train Elisha. Notice some key things. He was to honor his father and mother. What's the scripture say in the New Testament? If you want to live long, honor your father and mother and live long. Live well. They wanted to put all things in order. Point two. I got the hiccups, excuse me. <laughs> all right. Made a wonderful little slider earlier. So Elijah threw his mantle on Elisha to have him come under the influence. Remember, he who dwells in this secret place shall abide under the influence of the Almighty. So Elisha threw the mantle on and had him come under Elisha's influence and the anointing that was on him. So when he gets ready to toss his mantle on Elisha, remember he's the understudy, He's going to get the anointing that's on Elijah, the teacher, and plus what God wants to give him afterwards. Key point, key point, because Jesus had a mantle, and those under him need to pick it up. Point three, when you yield more often to God's will and not our own, the power then can work with us and begin to just soak in us. Okay, I'll tell you a story about that. And, become a, and then you become what's called a faithful servant of the Most High because it's just a part of you. You're like a magnet wants to stick to God. You know? So I want to tell you something. Back in the, when we started the first in ministry, we had a church up in Buckley. Everyone say Buckley. Buckley. Buckley's where I went to school. So you can look me up. No. Anyway, Buckley, I went to school. Our church was in a Masonic temple. Yeah. And we had to cover things up. We had to pray over everything. But we did it faithfully every week. So we had what was called the Porta Potty Church. Where you move in, set up the chairs, anoint everything, cover up the weird whacked out stuff, and then you have church. A porta potty church. And then when you're done, you tear down, put everything back in order, and off you go because the building doesn't belong to you. Now, what we did is because it was a Masonic temple and there's a lot of spirits that are not of God, we would anoint everything so regularly the power of God would permeate into the bricks and the front of the altar. I'm not kidding. And people who guest speakers came, my, my daughter is witness to this when we brought uh, Terry and Carrie Nelson and the interpreters. Remember the chocolate man? And anyway, so it was really good. She's just a little bitty. But we walked back and forth in the altar and pray and hold hands. I, I missed that. And by the time, after about a year of that, the people would come and the speakers would come. The, they said the floor vibrated with the anointing. You could walk right up there and you could just sense God's anointing. I, so I went to the Lord in prayer. I said, Lord, why is it? He says, anytime there's consistency. Everyone say consistency. consistency. If I'm consistent, you're consistent, and we're constantly being exposed to God. It's going to permeate into us. And if you can do it so much, your bones will be anointed. 
Maybe you shouldn't be cremated. Maybe tell them to throw your bones out and hit a few sinners. No, I'm joking with that. Or, you know, Ezekiel, dry bones will rise up. Anyway, so kind of fun with you, but think of it. Amen. Who do you have living in you? Jesus. And where are you living? You're living in God. Well, he says, we're hidden in Christ in God. So he says, if you be risen with Christ, you know, if you be risen, that seek those things above for your life is hidden in Christ in God. So you think about that. It's really hard to get it around your head. What that actually means. But he's not lying to us. <laughs> All right. So let's drop down second Kings. Further on about Elijah and Elisha. Second Kings chapter 2 verses 1 through 14. Reading rather quickly. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind. That Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Gilgal was the place of the, the, the skull. Okay. But also the place of the rocks. Reminder. A reminder, the stones that they were to build, the 12 stones, every time they passed by, reminded them the victories they won through the wilderness. Okay, Gilgal, okay, just so you know. All right, so, and then he says, look, I'm going to Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. Bethel means house of God. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave your side. So they went down to Bethel. He's sticking to him like glue. Why? Because the prophet says, hey, you know this guy's going to go away one day. And if he does, so he's, oh no, he's not leaving. Okay, now, next scripture. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came to Elisha and said to him, do you not know that the Lord will take away your master from you today? And he said, yes, I know it. Keep silent. Stop reminding me. Okay? Then Elisha said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. Jer Jericho means descending of the Lord. But he says, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I'm not going to leave you. So they both came to Jericho. So I, the idea is to get this, okay? So there's going to be a wonderful little deal I'm going to point out to you, okay? All right, so they went on. So, and then it says, and 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them in, in the distance while the two of them stood by at the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. And it was divided this way and that so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Pretty impressive, huh? And so it was when they had crossed over the Elijah Remember, that's the teacher, said to Elisha, the student, ask what you may that I may do to you before I am taken away from you. And Elisha says, oh boy, <laughs> I, I want a double portion, right? Here we go. He'd been with his, his, his prophet teacher, seeing all the miracles. So if you ever follow along, Elisha, who studied under Elijah, had twice as many to the exact number as Elijah, his teacher. So watch what happens, okay? Hey, look, stay here. Okay, and the 50 men, sons of the prophet, went and stood facing them. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, he said, and so it was when they crossed over Elijah and Elisha. Asked, what may I do for you? And I, when I take it away from me, and Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Say double portion. Double portion. Good request. So he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me, when I am taken from you, it shall be so. You shall have the double portion. Everyone go, yay! So he's, he's got an end, doesn't he? Next page, Gary. 
Got to rip it out of there. Make sure I don't got two. Oh, I got two. Oh, it's a type of shuttle, a lot of things. Yeah, you're right. Okay, all right, so. And he left the oxen and came after Elijah. All right, so. Then oh, I dropped down. I got the wrong page. I said, oh, here we go. And then it happened as they continued on and talked the suddenly a chariot of fire. You want to see a type of rapture? Chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire. So they spirit horses and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven and Elisha saw it. Ah! You can imagine how excited he was. Can you say amen? Now I'm going to make sure I don't lose my spot here. So, Okay. Look at I see you. Amen. I can just imagine this. Okay. So, he, he, and then this is Elijah saw it. He, he sh cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel. And it's the horseman. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes. Listen, very important. We've got to stop trying to serve God in our own abilities. That's what that represents. You need to rip away your clothes and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he took hold of the own clothes and tore them into two pieces. And he also took the man of Elijah and had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan, the descending of the Lord. And he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elijah crossed over. And you go, wow, that's exciting. A greater than Elisha is here. Okay, all right. God's power will fall. That's the next point. All right, so did you notice that Elijah's willingness to stick like glue to his mentor. Man, you can't get two people to walk together without arguing. And he was studying ever more. Amen. Let's be just like he was. Follow after God. Two, Elijah was willing to invest everything to gain the favor of God in his life. How about you? And Elijah got, number three, a double portion of what Elijah had. Wow. Wow. It did twice as much for God. And fourthly, now let's bring you up to speed. Elijah is a type of forerunner. Everyone say forerunner. forerunner. And that means somebody goes before another person. Like, for example, if we're in a race and I'm ahead of BJ, I'm forerunning BJ. Like John the Baptist came before Jesus. He's the forerunner. Like Elijah was a forerunner of Elisha. It's a person that's before them. Okay, got it? Say, well, I got it. All right. So, so let's bring you up. Elijah, type of forerunner like John was to Jesus. And guess who picked up Jesus' mantle? The church. Or at least we're supposed to. Because the Bible says in our day, the last days, there'll be some that have... A form of godliness. Now listen, this is what Paul says. But they don't have any power. They look religious. They smell religious. They act religious. Maybe got the words down. I'm not trying to put anybody down. But inside, they're still sinning. I mean, they're deliberately sinning. You and I make plenty of mistakes, and you're going to go out and, and pull a bobo to you. You will. But you're not going out there to file in God and, and you know, giving God the, you know, the fist or anything. You, you're human. So God deals with you as sons and daughters, not as sinners. But a defiant child, the wrath of God comes down on. So the wrath of God is upon the children that disobey. Ephesians 2. So I'm not trying to play any games. That's not you. You're following God. You're too busy loving God, getting caught up. You want the double portion. Can you say amen? amen. You don't want to fool around, play church. 
I don't want to clothe myself with me. <laughs> what a bummer that would be. Oh, I'm a poet. All right, so let's look at this. John 16, 6 and 7. But now I go away, Jesus said, to him who, who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? Jesus is wondering, why aren't the people asking the right questions? I really want to say to you, you guys, everyone, you guys are wonderful people. Why don't you ask the right questions, the questions you need to know to make your walk better? Instead, we're just kind of loping along, hoping God's going to give a morsel. No, you should be writing down things that are working, things you need to know, and it should be a calculated question asking. That's what his disciples were doing. They were learning. Jesus, why? Jesus, how come? Was this man born blind? So ask, point a question. Have God give you the questions. Amen. You could do it. Say, I could do it. Where are you going, they said. And then verse 9 says, But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Look at I'm leaving. Oh, Jesus, don't do that. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Now listen, it's to your advantage that I go away. In other words, I got to go up there, seal the deal. Then the Holy Spirit's going to bring the Father and I back. So he's, I'm just kind of giving you a prelude. Nevertheless, listen, it's important that I go away. So if you do not, if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I depart, he says, I will send him to you. Say amen. amen. Now look at Acts chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. I got the hiccups again, so I'm going to take a sip here. It's a shameless sip. All right. Acts chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. Therefore, when he had come together, all of them together with Jesus, they asked him, saying, Lord, will, and this is very important that you listen to this, because people are still asking these questions. And are, Jesus already answered this. Listen, Jesus never really told somebody something he didn't mean. Oh, I'm just doing it. Oh, I didn't mean it. <laughs> so we, look at this. Let's, so will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Legitimate question. Selfish, but legitimate. And he said to them, it's not for you to know those times and the seasons which the fathers put in his own power. In other words, that's not the right question to ask. But he says, here's what you should be concerning. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So what does the church do? They go out there and they look at this and this is this. And they write books about end times and prophecies and all that. And people who are not basically built in the word, they're taking all this. And they don't know what pieces fit what. And you know what? Their hearts begin to fear for looking after the things that are coming on the earth. Not understanding the timeline of scripture. There's a church age. There's a rapture, there's a tribulation, there is a second coming, there's a millennial reign. you got to know where those things are. No problem, just come on in and one of my teachings will teach you. I'm just joking. But there, it's really uh, easy to understand. Once you get those pieces together, though, everything else sort of comes together. You're not guessing and pulling one scripture from here. I mean, I listened to a guy today, bless his heart. He loves God with all his heart. But he just got everything out of sorts. He's speculating. How many know it's a dangerous thing to speculate over the world? Word? Huh? I think God means. Did you hear Jesus say that? I think my father means. Remember? He says, I speak as one. Not as the scribes, but as one having authority. Do you guys know what scribes are? Secretaries. So when they, so when they scribe the word, they would get up and say, Gamaliel says, yeah, and says, uh, Santa Chui says, now you choose which one's right. And that's how it went on in the synagogue. So then they spent the rest of the afternoon eating and arguing with each other. 
Sounds like church to me. <laughs> Moving right on past all of that. So the traditions of men make the power of God in none effect. So he says, look, we want to know, are you going to restore us? Are you going to restore us, Jesus? And Jesus says, hey, you're not supposed to be concentrating on that. You're supposed to be concentrating on how to be a witness with my power. Instead of running around telling everybody your opinion. Moving right along. Say amen. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. See the mantle? The mantle does what? Doesn't come in you. Doesn't bubble up. It comes upon you. Key. Keep that in mind. Okay. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Puyallup. Jesus ascends into heaven. Now when he had spoken these things, now listen, they watched and he was taken up. There's a rapture right there. He was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. What did he tell them to do? Take the mantle. Go to Jerusalem. Be clothed with power. You get a chance to read it in Luke last week. It says, go to Jerusalem and tarry for the, 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 for the Holy Spirit, for you shall be receive power. Okay? And the word he uses is be cloaked or mantled. Go to Jerusalem and wait for the mantle. And then pick it up and put it on. Say amen. amen. Now remember, Elisha went up. Elijah looked at him and says, I see you. Remember the promise. And he goes, okay. Throws his mantle down. Jesus just went up. 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, we have what? Pentecost. Pentecost. And at that 50th day, the Holy Spirit came down like a mantle into the earth. And God said, anytime anyone calls upon me, they shall be what? So it's up to each individual to choose Jesus and to pick up the mantle of ministry. And that's us. And it's not that hard because God does the work. We just wear the mantle. And God showed me a little vision. Maybe, maybe you can laugh at this. God gives me these little laughable visions. There's a whole bunch of people I, in my dream I was ordering me around. And I was getting steamed. And I knew who I was. But I was trying to be patient with these people. And they were telling me to do this. And they were telling me to do that. And they were telling me to do this. Finally, I reached in. I said, if you guys have it now. And I pulled out my badge. And I said, official Jesus follower, back off. See, what we're doing is we're trying to rebuke in behalf of Jesus instead of using Jesus as a badge which already rebukes the devil. All you've got to do is push Jesus out of you and shine. And man, Satan's running. Why? Because darkness runs from light. Our God is light, isn't he, Danny? Yes. And in him is what? No. So don't project yourself. Don't try to brag on yourself or try to impress others. Project Jesus, and they all think you're an angel. Amen. Don't get in the way. Think you have to jump in the front seat and take the steering wheel away from Jesus. All right, moving right along. A couple of points. You and I, as believers, must learn to pick up and use God's mantle, his anointing, and wear it and use it efficiently. Someone say amen. amen. Two, the Holy Spirit's assignment is to teach each one of us how to be led by the Spirit, how to use the equipment, how to order our steps with the anointing power, the mantle. Thirdly, this is a new cloth on a human believer. We must be trained in the disciplines of God. We hear the word discipline. Oh, no. Discipline. No, we're not sending you to the gym. <laughs> 
You need to be disciplined to hear the word, disciplined to read the word, disciplined to meet with God first thing in the morning. And if you don't do that, here's another one. And this one, all of us, I mean, I failed at this the first couple of years of my marriage. Discipline to pray with your spouse. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold that point. You don't pray together, folks. You're only half as good as you normally could be. Could God join you two together to be one? So I'm not trying to pick, see people always, he's picking on me. No, you're guilty of not praying. So instead of get the condemnation coming, start doing it and watch the benefactors come. Just remind each other. You got to get in the habit. Everyone say, moving right along. <laughs> but notice Elisha would not leave Elijah alone. Linda and I are like that. We talk about everything. We have some what I call it, a little bit of intense fellowship, but never like when we first got married. It says when you get married, there's two pieces of flesh that God made one. But the only two things that of that marriage that have a problem is our flesh. You know? And so it takes a while to adjust that. Listen, it works this way. Your spirit operates, influences your soul to control your flesh. Everyone say self-control. You know that friend that you had in high school that seemed to have no self-control? You know? What did you end up doing? He stayed home. <laughs> Leave your bot at home. You come to church, don't bring your problems. It's not a dump zone. It's a gas station. Christians always want to come in and get everybody's consensus and mess everything up. Then they go away and they don't do any of it. What a mess that is. Moving right off of this and right back onto number four. So in the day you and I live in, people are looking for signs. They're looking for power in Christians. Do you believe that? Yeah. Remember the Jews seek after a sign, but you know, we're supposed to display signs. Uh, we need to check the seasons. We need to operate in the spirit. So in this day, people are looking for signs, checking seasons. They're reading their stupid horoscopes. They're asking, seeking other places. And step, instead of going through Christ and getting their answer. Because of this, the enemy wants to distract us, discourage us, even make us want to give up or become carnal and ineffective. Everyone say, no! Almost done. Okay. So we need to be a humble, confident believer. Everyone look at somebody else and see humble, confident believer. Okay. Remember it says in Philippians 2 verse 5, let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus. What did Jesus do? He brought no attention to himself. He doesn't run around and go, look what I did, look what I did, look what I did. Look what God's doing for me. La, 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 Please be quiet. Go sit back there. <laughs> you don't want to be noticed by men. You want to be pleasing God. So none of you fit any of that. So say, whew, amen. So you and I, let us crave good training in a way of God. Why? We need to know what... what how our spirit operates, how the kingdom operates. How do I get my hands on the gifts? How do I sense when God wants to move through me and or God just wants me to enjoy the day and have fun with my family? What do I, how do I need to do? First of all, it comes through exposure to God. All right. I'm going to sneeze. Oh, exposure to God. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I... I I'll tell you after the microphone. I trimmed my hairs and my nose and, you know. Amen. I'm sorry about that. It's always good. Don't braid them. Trim them. <laughs> anyway, so it's for the people in the camera. It's all fun. We have fun, don't we? Oh, yeah. oh Pastor Kerry, you can agree with the Holy Spirit. Boy, you really don't know the Holy Spirit, do you? I mean, he's got a sense of humor. You know what he said when I was born? Whew, we need a Savior. 
Okay, moving right along. So be humble, confident believer. So your prayer, part of your prayer should be, Lord, help me to be humble always and to be confident in who I am in you. You see the difference? Your confidence is in him, who you are in him. Your confidence is in how good you can quote scripture. Everybody asks me, how can you quote scripture like that? I says, I have no idea. I don't. It just comes out. So let's look at Acts chapter uh, 2, 1 through 4, and Luke 24, 48. Uh, excuse me. Let's go to Luke uh, 24, 49, and then Acts 2. Well, let's do it that way. Okay. So I'll just wait a minute. I'm going to take another sip. Luke uh, 24, 49. This is where Jesus says, go to Jerusalem and wait. The word tarry there means to wait. It says, behold, I send the promise of my Father. What was the promise? That the Holy Spirit was going to come. Prophet Joel talks about it in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through the end. Okay? But in the last days, I'll pour out my Spirit. And it says, and uh, the promise of my Father upon you. Notice what it says. Behold, I said the promise of the Spirit of my Father upon you. What is it? A cloaking, isn't it? See? Most people don't see that. When I was, I was raised in an old-time charismatic Pentecostal Bible study. Not weird, but just... And one of the things they didn't teach too much about was being clothed with the Holy Spirit was very important because not only are we clothed with the Holy Spirit, we're clothed with the armor, aren't we? And the armor is armor of light. And the armor really is Jesus. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't give in to your flesh, is what it says. All right. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord, in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. The Holy Spirit came into the atmosphere like never before. That's the rushing mighty wind. And then look it. And there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. And it sat, look at the next word, upon each of them. You see, in the Bible, little words mean a lot. If it says in, it doesn't mean out. Hello? So if it says in the river, you're not out of the river, you are in the river. If you are in Christ, you're not out of Christ, you are in Christ. So stop acting like you're out of Christ. Because you're out of your mind. That's how dumb it looks. And the devil just has a heyday watching you try to be spiritual. Hey, pray with your wife. <laughs> or pray with your husband. Okay, so now, listen. And there appeared on them divided tongues as the fire sat on each upon of them. And they were all filled. See, came on them, but now they're being filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You see, here's the key. Inside your spirit, God now lives. He lit everything back alive again. So that language God put in your spirit, remember, where did your spirit come from? Come on. From God. And where did your soul come from? God. A lot of our souls came empty with just a few programs in it. But later on, we picked up. Right? But it comes from God, right? And the flesh come from mom and dad. So you got them to blame. <laughs> I always used to, have, I had girlfriends all the time. I always used to come over and look at my folks. I said, what are you looking at my folks for? I want to see how handsome you're going to be later on in life. <laughs> I thought, what? <laughs> Moving right along. Isn't that funny how people do funny things? I never heard of that before. Okay, now, there appeared cloven tongues. Remember the language... God doesn't hit you with the star wrench and you just suddenly get this sky hook and the language starts. No, you have to begin to speak as the Spirit gives you utterance. 
So how many has ever been to an old cabin? In order to get the water out of the pump, you had to pour a little water in the pump. Yeah. Do you remember anybody remember that? It's called priming the pump. Okay, or you had to suck a little air out of the hose for the rest to be followed down through the siphon. Can you say amen? All these laws and principles work with God, you know. Are you with me? And so the language was already there, got lit up. Now, when we use our language, not only do we charge ourselves up, but we literally suck out of the realm of the spirit like a bucket going down into the wellsprings of wisdom, pulling out from God the things that we need for the moment and for the future. So it's very crucial that we utilize our utterance. Can you say amen? But it's up to you. I, here, we're not going to force you to do it. But I'd like to encourage you to do it as often as you can when you feel comfortable with you and God, all right? A couple of points and we're done. Point one, the, this mantle comes upon you. We must learn then to function with it, to pick it up and to wear it. For a lot of Christians, they think they're never going to be perfect. So they'll serve God. It'll be good for a couple of weeks. But then all of a sudden, they'll go back into the old slump. God doesn't want you to do that. You remember those days. You get all excited. And then by the time Friday comes along, Saturday drops. And then Sunday, you're a mess again. Thank God we overcome that. Say amen. amen. So when it says, look, the mantle comes upon you, we must learn to pick it up, wear it. It's the supernatural armor. It's the super pure luminous light. Everyone say luminous light. Luminous. luminous light not only is fire and luminous, but if you can imagine the rainbow, right? What is seven colors in the rainbow? Yep. But you know, beyond the rainbow, there's ultraviolet, there's Blu-ray, and all these other spectrums of light. Now, could you imagine from God's spectrum, if he is light, God is light, how many luminous spectrums does God have if we're willing to open up and allow him to penetrate? We use certain ultraviolet lights to kill bacteria. When you sit in God, listen to me, you sit in God's presence, his luminous is killing your flesh and all the slime, negative thoughts and junk that's climbing around. Sit there long enough for all to die. <laughs> Clean the oven. <laughs> you, you know, let the luminous penetrate you and burn away the chaff. You say, what's the fire for? Our God's a consuming fire. So it burns away the chap. So what actually happens is some of those nasty habits and stuff you think nobody else knows about, okay? And we all do. God knows. He's burning them away. So eventually you don't fall privily to those temptations and or little jigadoos, whatever they may be. Say amen. Oh, you said don't point at them. Okay, so, all right. Two. The works that I do, didn't remember? Jesus said, shall you do also? Why? Because God lives in you. Who's actually doing the work, folks? God. You're just opening your mouth like a pointer. You are like a pin in an artist's hand. You're a paintbrush in God's hands. You open up and God pours out. You open up, God pours out. You clam up, God sits there. That's why Peter and John came to the gate beautiful and said, silver and gold have I none. But what I have, I'm a container of Almighty God, I will give you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Yanked him by the hand, pulled him right up on his feet. Done that several times in church, out of wheelchairs. We've had at least almost 10 people through my lifetime in ministry, somehow, one way or another, came out of wheelchairs. Two in this place. And then you go, well, how does that happen? Well, it didn't, wasn't me. <laughs> I just obeyed God. Can you say amen? 
All right, thirdly, the mantle of the Lord will give you at least this manifestation of power. You shall receive dynamic power to do miracles after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, Acts 1.8. Fourthly, there are five Greek words of power. Do you remember? Cover your page. Yeah. Very good, you guys. Exousia is the, the word for the authority to use power. So they are exousia, dynamos, kratos, iskus, and energeia. Each one tells us the truth. Exousia, the authority to use power. I got the hiccups again, sorry. <laughs> Kratos, mighty strength in operation. God's mighty strength in your, in your heart in operation. Iskus, bold forcefulness in excellent execution. Energia, energy. Okay, energizing or working to efficiency. Okay, and operation. Okay, all right. And dunamis, the ability to produce miracle working power on display. Ephesians 1.19 contains four of the five. Are you with me? Use your tongues to fan the flames of God inside of you. Let God out when he wants to come out. Remember, we take his yoke upon him. We learn from him. We let him walk us through life because we're the young bucks, the young persons that need to be taught by Elijah. And we follow him the best we can because we know the benefits are wonderful. They are, I can tell you. They're absolutely breathtaking. He fills all your days. There's no cracks. Isn't that right, dear? And not only that, the increase as you get used to walking with him and enjoying him, going through praying, praying with your spouse, doing all those things, it just starts coming together because you know you're not doing it. You thought if you could do it just right, all these blessings would turn around. No, that's the lie. You just go to God and you stick to him. If you can imagine yourself, wrap your arms around God's legs or chest and you're not going to let go of them. God's trying to go, come on, Sherry, get out of here. <laughs> you know. Did you get something out of that tonight? All right, so next week we're going to finish up with this. We're going to, again, show the offices of the anointings. We'll go through it rather quickly, but we'll give you some insight so you won't be uneducated according to what the giftings and the callings that God gave through Christ with the kingdom in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. all right, so Father, right now.